I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Boonificast. I'm your spooky host this time around, Dean Detloff. You didn't even come up with a scary name for yourself? I I'm just your spooky host. I don't know, how, how can I get any spookier than that? <laughs> Oh, like the you like the crypt keeper? Yeah, I'm like the crypt keeper, but I but I'm the spooky host. Okay, and I'm your other co-host, co uh, Count Matt. You'll uh, blah, 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 blah. that's a good one. See, I did. You it. did do it. It was good. You did, but you're also just a co-host. So I'd say my title is better. Your name is better. With our powers combined, this is one <laughs> spooky podcast. Uh, that's right, folks. It's October and it's early. Um, but you know what? The spirit of Halloween's are moving in, and I feel like that is a sign enough that it's time for us to do one spooky episode. Matt and I've been too busy lately. Way too busy to do a podcast once a week, and nevertheless, we keep on doing it. And in our planning and hanging out this week, we thought, you know what? We're both feeling some spooky vibes and we're going to lean into them in this episode. So is there going to be Christian content? Yes. Is it going to be left wing content? Well, I guess we'll have to Maybe. see. <laughs> we'll find out. It's all left wing content if you think about it. That's right. Um, under capitalism, all this podcast is all left wing content. Um, and even afterwards, too, it will still be left wing content. Matt, why don't we just start? Getting into the spooky spirit here, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Have you ever seen a ghost? Nope, never seen a ghost. Well, I guess do do TikToks count? I've seen a ghost on right. TikTok. Who hasn't? Who hasn't? They're all over the place on TikTok. That app. <laughs> um, in real life, though, no, I've never seen one. One time I did thought I, I did hear kind of like a voice in my house. Mm. And it was, sorry, I need to preface the story. I heard I was like uh, six and I heard a voice Whoa. in my house and I don't know. I probably didn't really, you know, what did it say? You're, you're, I don't know. I think it just said my name or maybe something else. But <laughs> I did tell my babysitter about it and she told my parents about it. And then my parents never had that person babysit. Again, so. <laughs> well, she brought the kind of there, so screwed that up. Right. She brought, I guess that's what happened. I don't know. So, I mean, who knows? Uh, I don't think I've seen it. Have you seen a ghost? I've never seen a ghost. My parents have both seen a ghost on the highway while driving. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it is. What? The, a highway ghost? A highway ghost, yep. Uh, the way they tell it is uh, I'm from rural Michigan, so they were driving the country roads of rural Michigan, just the two of them, and uh, they had their headlights on. They were the only people on the road, and a big spooky ghost floated across the hood of my dad's truck and my dad Interesting. my dad said to my mom did you see that and my mom said yeah did you see that and he said yeah and that was the end of it hmm that's really cool though that's cool they didn't make a big thing about it you know too many people today they're on tiktok and they're <laughs> like did you see this ghost <laughs> but your parents they didn't you just live they're, they're just living their lives you know we're catholic and uh there's a lot of ghosts hanging around in our faith tradition so i think it's it just stands to reason um i also appreciate that they were like this is just one spooky farmer farmhouse ghost uh it is crossing the street at an ungodly hour but you know my parents are driving at an ungodly hour so who's really a fault here they they were asking for it they were asking for it man uh you said that thing about hearing a voice and i feel like i just heard a voice and i'm like sucking myself out <laughs> in my apartment my oh, man, my one bedroom no, apartment you live in an apartment that's also by a busy parking lot, and like <laughs> it was probably some. Don't don't be scared. It's just somebody outside, probably. Ooh, let's hope. Or maybe it was a ghost, and I, that's cool too. Yeah, let's hope they, they stay can be on the podcast. Um, famously, I uh, I do not like 
spooky things unless they're fun if they're fun it's fine if they're too scary it's too scary for me matt famously loves scary spooky things so um name one fun spooky thing that you do love one fun spooky thing i like like old timey horror movies are fine like if you can okay. kind of see the seams um that's mm-hmm. okay but if uh i have one of those brains where like i get too sucked into the fantasy and then i'm just right there yeah yeah i get it that makes a lot of sense um i do i fa- famously do love scary things I, I guess i grew up in a really uh a really repressed sort of uh conservative home where i wasn't allowed to watch scary things but now on this side of life uh i do i i partake in them all the time and i think it's just fine and i love it so it's cool um well good I mean, given all that, that being the case, let's talk about the spooky things within Christianity. There's so many spooky things that we could talk about. Um, you got the Holy Ghost. That's not really spooky, though. That's just a cool thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the real spooky thing, though, is all of these wild saints that are running around out there. Um, Dean, one time I did come to visit you and you told me about this dude's heart that is built into the side <laughs> of a church. So, like, what's going on with that? Yeah, that's right. Here in Toronto, there is a guy's heart that is just in a wall somewhere. I've never been to find it. I should go. I've lived here long enough that there's not really any good excuse. But um, the best part is there's not really even that much of a story. This guy was like a convert who had a lot of money and he decided that's what he wanted to do with it, to put his heart in a wall. So he did. OK, and in, in that story, he's not really a saint himself. No. He's just a guy with a lot of money, a convert, a guy with a lot of money who is really zealous about it. Uh, but we, you know, Catholics love that kind of stuff. If we can pickle your finger and cart that around for a while, uh, we will. If your blood turns to liquid three times a year, you better believe we're going to go pray in front of it. It's a spooky faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as a recovering evangelical and now Episcopalian, I don't have as spooky of a faith. What? Why? Why do the Catholics do this? Um, that's a great question. If I was a theologian, I would have a good answer to it, probably. Um, I think it's better that you're not because you're going to give a really like a real answer. Right. To it, you know, because a theologian would be like, oh, it's about the the cloud of witnesses back through time. Yeah. And we're all just doing this religion. But you're going to tell me the real answer. So go let's ahead. see. I'll come up with a few. <laughs> I'll come up with a few candidates and the listener can decide which one is the real answer. Um, one is yeah, uh, we, you know, we sucked up all the non-Christian or pre-Christian cultures that we could find as we Christianized Europe and the rest of the world. And um, that's uh, that's just what we've got. We we decided to make Christianity weird and then just pretend that it was ours the whole time. So that's one. Um one way we keep that, that's pretty that good. stuff around. A good answer. I think so. Another is, uh, let's see, we Catholics think that the body is pretty yucky. Um, you shouldn't get too into it, but also you got to have it. And so you got to get excited about it. So uh, it's a, a very embodied faith tradition, which is what I love the most about it. I love that it is uh, all about eating God's literal body and blood <laughs> every Sunday. That cracks me up still. Um, and I think that is very cool about the Catholic tradition. There's a real, uh, emphasis placed on bodily life, even while, uh, you know, you gotta be, you gotta be vigilant and wary about what your body's, uh, getting, getting you into. Sure. That makes sense. Those are some pretty good answers. So, okay. In light of those things, uh, not only do the, are the lives of the saints important, but all the wacky things that they do are for, are end up being kind of important too. Um, so let's do that. Let's talk about the lives of the saints. And all of those very interesting things that they do with their lives <laughs> and afterlives, even. Um, there are so many. Uh, so Dean and I kind of rounded up just a few of the the most fun and spooky things to celebrate this early October spooky season. Um, and we're going to talk about them and just kind of get into their spooky, scary ghost stories. These are these are the most Christian ghost stories you can find because there's mostly no ghosts in them, but they are pretty wild. And uh, maybe they'll get you in the spooky October feeling. Yep, I think that's right. Um, you know, as we're just saying the word spooky over and over, I also was remembering. Um, you remember in uh, the autobiography of Asada Shakur, she talks about converting to Catholicism as a kid. Oh, yeah. Uh, she, Oh, she says the spookiest. Yeah, religion. she says that's like why she converted. It was the spookiest religion around. So anyway, I appreciate that from a social yeah. core. You know, it's true. I love that. There's there's a lot of really bad reasons for becoming a Christian, or let alone a Catholic. But um, 
But man, that you find it very spooky and that you're into that, that's good. That's a good reason. I think so too. Uh, it's it's one thing that keeps me in. So anyway, yeah, we're going to talk about these spooky saints. And I want to talk about one of my favorite spooky saints, Matt. This one is, I would say, um, let's see, on the scale of like fun spooky to spooky spooky, I would say... We do have to rate them all. This is a very important part Yeah, of right, right. I would say this one lends more toward the actually spooky side. Um Mm -hmm. And I love that about him. Uh, So this is Bartholomew the Apostle. If you've never seen a statue of Bartholomew the Apostle, I encourage you to Google it right now because you do have to kind of get the image to have it uh, present, (laughs) to have the spookiness present. Um, And the big thing about Bartholomew, we'll talk about his story in a minute, but he was apparently like flayed alive, like all of his skin was torn off. And uh, he in statues is depicted like carrying it around. Um, So if you see a statue of St. Bartholomew, it's like you can see all of his all of his muscles. And he has this kind of like on first glance, it looks like drapery or something, which is extremely cool. But actually, it's just his skin. That's a spooky one right there. Um, You know what? That that crosses the line, actually. That's not just spooky. That's. It's pretty gross, man. I think so, too. If I saw that in a movie, I'd be like, yuck. (laughs) Yep. Um, So pretty fascinating guy. He was also beheaded. So they really wanted to make sure that he was done for. (laughs) And I mean, they they didn't. Um, That's the thing with the saints. They always come back um, in one way or another. Yeah, well, let's get let's get into a story, maybe more explicitly. Um, I pulled I pulled these great saint stories from around the Internet um, but most of these stories, they uh, they all kind of come out of this pretty wild text called the Golden Rule. No, it's not. It's not called that <laughs> shit. You can call it the Golden Rule. It'll be fine. It's called the Golden Legend. That sounds better. Um, it does sound better. Uh, and yeah, it's just like this. Uh, I mean, it's like a, an early hagiography that like kind of um, tells you what's going on with these saints and like what they're doing. And, uh, you know, I think if we were really responsible podcasters, we would tell you all about, like, what their life and witness means for the church and all these kinds of great things we can pull out of them. But no, we're not good podcasters. We're not good Christians. We're (laughs) going to talk about their awful, the the awful parts of their stories or maybe the most like fantastic parts. Yeah, this is this is one just for the the hard Marxist materialist to scroll on by. You know, uh, we talk a lot about materialism (laughs) on this podcast. Not this time. We're leaning into the weirdest, wildest uh, metaphysical garbage we can find. Yeah, I think it's probably for the best, though. Um, I mean, materialism, it's great. I love it. But also, uh, do you in materialism, do you get people whose flesh have been ripped off of them and they come back to life? No, you don't. Um, OK, so here's some stuff about St. Bartholomew. Um, OK, Bartholomew is reputed to have brought Christianity to Armenia in the first century. <laughs> Santa King. Great job, guy. <laughs> um he and uh, another uh, one of his apostles are considered the patron saints of Armenia, uh, of the Armenian of Apostolic Church. Uh, one tradition has it that Apostle Bartholomew was executed in Albanopolis. <laughs> I guess that's a real city in Armenia. According to uh, a popular hagiography, the apostle was flayed alive and beheaded like we've talked about so much already. According to other accounts, he was crucified upside down uh, with his head downward like St. Peter. That's a great story that we should talk about some other time. Um, and he is said to have been martyred for having converted Paul, uh, Polymius, the king of Armenia, to Christianity. Okay, so that's it. Uh, you convert you convert the king of Armenia to Christianity. People don't like you, and they rip your skin off, and that's awful. Um, there are some very uh, some some other like uh, less spooky but very interesting stories around uh, miracles, sort of in his death. Um, so in uh. In Armenia, there are these two stories, at least uh, as detailed in Wikipedia, uh, about uh, the statue of St. Bartholomew. So on the feast day uh, at the Cathedral of St. Bartholomew, people like get the statue of uh, of him out and they carry it around through town and kind of parade it around. It seems like a good time. I'm all about <laughs> that. Um, anyways, uh, the story goes, when taking the statue down the hill towards the town, it suddenly became very heavy and they had to be set down. Spooky. When the yeah, spooky <laughs> this statue's now heavy. When the men carrying the statue regained their strength, they lifted it a second time. And after another few seconds, it got even heavier. 
Then they set it down and attempted one more time to pick it up. They managed to lift it, but had to put it down one last time. Within seconds, walls further downhill collapsed. If the statue had been able to be lifted, all the townspeople would have been killed. Hmm. Hmm. The good spooky. <laughs> that's the good one. Um, it's the ghost that's looking out for you, and that's Casper cool. style. Uh, <laughs> Casper style for sure. Okay, so there's that story. Then there's one more that is also very funny, and this is where we can get that good left wing content yeah, yeah. That we do love. Uh, during World War II, the fascist regime looked for ways to finance their activities. The order was given to take the silver statue of St. Bartholomew and melt it down. The statue was weighed, and it was found only to be a few grams in weight. It was returned to its place in the Cathedral of Lipari, uh, but in reality, the statue was made from many kilograms of silver. <laughs> it is considered a miracle that it was not melted down. Um, and then the Wikipedia article end, uh, uh, around the around the miracles, it does end with this sentence I do love. St. Bartholomew is credited with many other miracles having to do with the weight of objects. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, if you have something that's very heavy and you need it to be lighter, St. Bartholomew is your guy. And if you have something that's very light that you need to be very heavy, also your guy. He knows what he's doing on these on these two things. What a prankster, this guy. Uh, you're just going to get your pen and sign that check for rent. And uh, oh, no, wouldn't you know it? You can't even lift it. I love that. What a good joke. <laughs> you can't even. Um, so St. Bartholomew, certified anti-fascist. That's what we can say about that. Yeah. That's true. Certified anti-fascist, or at least just extremely pro-statue. <laughs> That's his thing. I mean, he... Maybe he maybe he'd be a big fascist, but uh, he wasn't going to let them melt down his statue. And that's that's cool. No, I'm going to say well, it's not really. But I'm going to say he's a Gramscian. He was uh, definitely, <laughs> you know, down down with the whole thing, countering, uh, creating a counter hegemony by not allowing his uh, statue to get melted down for Mussolini's uh, even worse uh, instruments. That's true. He's a Gramscian. It's the war of maneuver. They can't even pick it up to move it around. <laughs> um, great. Let's talk about another another good saint. This one, this one's real spooky. Um, if uh, someone being flayed alive wasn't spooky enough for you, this is a real one. There's a real zombie factor in this one <laughs> that you're gonna love. Uh, so, Dean, you ever heard of a little town called Paris? I've heard of it once or twice. Yeah, it's a big one. People people know about it. So uh, there is a, a saint that is associated with Paris, uh, specifically a place called Montmartre, which is like a big. Uh, a big uh, sort of religious epicenter in, in Paris. Uh, anyways, St. Denis. That's not really how you'd say his name, but I'm not French. So I'm not going to start trying now. <laughs> uh, probably Denis, but I'm not going. Again, I'm not going to, even though I just did. Anyways, St. Denis and his companions were so effective in converting people that pagan priests became alarmed over their loss of followers. Uh, at their instigation, the Roman governor arrested the missionaries. After a long imprisonment, Dennis and his two clergy were executed by beheading on the highest hill in Paris, um, which was likely to have been a druidic holy place. After his head was cut off, Dennis is, set, Dennis is said to have picked it up and walked several miles from the summit of the hill, preaching a sermon the entire way, making him one of the many cephalophores in hagiography. <laughs> Uh, the site where he stopped preaching and actually died was marked by a small shrine that developed into the Basilica of St. Denis in Paris, which became the burial place for, like, you know, all the kings. Um, man, this is I love this kind of story uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, but mostly it's cool that somebody <laughs> got beheaded and then they kept it. They uh, they picked up their head and kept walking. If you look for pictures of, of Dennis in like uh, in in like stained glass or in uh, manuscripts or whatever, he's always portrayed as like holding his head. So it's like it's there within the history of the church. This is this guy's walking around with his uh, head in his hands, um, and uh, that he kept preaching the entire way up the hill is extremely funny. That is the funniest um, part. I'm not owned moment for sure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not owned as I carry my head up the hill. Um, man, I, I love the term cephalophore for so many yeah. reasons. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff going on there. You know, uh, Michelle Sarah, who's a pretty famous French philosopher, um, someone that I think is pretty fascinating, um, kind of in the, in the weird vein of like sociology of science, but also just like a, just a weird philosophy and, guy. like weird, weird uh, French also... Catholic thinker. Exactly, yeah, a weird French Catholic thinker. Uh, he has uh, an, he he makes a reference to this story in uh, this one book that he wrote uh, pretty recently called Thumbelina. It's this uh, this book of philosophy that he wrote. Um, that's like it's about media and technology, 
And it is a very goofy book because it's like just a little more than 100 pages, I think, in total. And the the way that he like frames it is that this is like his his uh, love letter to millennials. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, he thinks that, um, you know, uh, phone, like instead of the the regular the, the instead of the regular boomer take that phones have broken our brains, he thinks that, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, phones are just like a thing that we're going to kind of have to come to terms with. And uh, they're kind of okay. Um, they're kind of okay. So just kind of embrace it. <laughs> it's kind of uh, the end of the story. But anyways, he invokes this particular story um, uh, of cephalophores. Like, uh, you know, it's like you're carrying your head in your hands <laughs> and, uh, and and your phone is kind of like your brain in, in this new media landscape. You know, you don't really have to worry about um, memorizing facts or something. Um, or, you know, you don't need to know how to do math because you could just like type in whatever to Google and it will tell you. So, uh, that's kind of part of his argument that, uh, that our, our mobile technology is in, uh, many ways, uh, our brains and we're carrying them around in our hands, like St. Dennis. I do love that. Um, St. Dennis is also the, uh, patron saint of headaches, uh, which I think is a good joke within the church. <laughs> um yeah pretty good <laughs> and uh yeah what, what what would michelle sayer have to say about that who could say um but it is cool i feel like uh it's our he's our very own headless horseman but in a much tamer way no fire from his eyes and a jack-o'-lantern just uh <laughs> just the horror of a sermon that will never end even if you cut off the head <laughs> of the pastor man pretty good um, cool. We have a few more too. Dean, do you want to read the story of Saint? Bob? Yeah. All right. Let me say though. Okay, Saint Dennis on the spooky scale. I would say not as oh please not him. as spooky as uh, Saint Bartholomew. The skin is yuckier for sure, but still pretty yeah. spooky. I think that he that he just keeps talking as he goes up the hill is more of a bit than it is scary. Yeah. That's exactly and, it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He uh, definitely on the funnier side of the scale. Yeah. Uh, well, this is, uh, going definitely more toward the, uh, the fun spooky side, the goofy side. This is the, the Disney Channel original movie Halloween Town version of a spooky saint. Um, Saint Barbara, this again, just continuing our extremely thorough research by reading Wikipedia to you on this podcast. Uh, Barbara, the daughter of a rich pagan named Dioscorus was carefully guarded by her father who kept her locked up in a tower in order to preserve her from the outside world. Having secretly become a Christian, <laughs> what a rebellious teen, uh, she rejected an offer of marriage that she received through her father. Before going on a journey, her father commanded that a private bathhouse be erected for her use near her dwelling, and during his absence, Barbara had three windows put in it as a symbol of the Holy Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of the two he originally intended. Take that, Dad. When her father returned, she acknowledged herself to be a Christian. Upon this, he drew his sword to kill her. But her prayers created an opening in the tower wall, and she was miraculously transported to a mountain gorge where two shepherds watched their flocks. Discorus, in pursuit of his daughter, was rebuffed by the first shepherd, but the second betrayed her. For doing this, he was turned to stone, and his flock changed to locusts. Uh, all right, sad ending here, as usual. Dragged before the prefect of the prophets, province Martanianus. Anyway, he had her cruelly t tortured. Uh, Barbara held true to her Christian faith. During the night, the dark prison was bathed in light and new miracles occurred. Every morning, her wounds were healed. Torches that were used to be to burn her went out as soon as they came near her. Finally, she was condemned, condemned to death by beheading. Her father himself carried out the sentence. However, as punishment, he was struck by lightning on the way home and his body was consumed by flame. Barbara was buried by a Christian Valentinus and her tomb became the site of miracles uh, she is also, fun fact, uh, the patron saint of explosives, <laughs> which is pretty wild. Anyway, uh, the biggest thing here, of course, and the goofy thing is that she did pray and then a big portal opened up and she walked through that and found a couple of shepherds uh, tending their flock. And uh, that's great. I love that for her. It, it rules. Um, not OK. On on the on the spooky scale, this one's not super spooky. Um, unless you're afraid of portals and most people aren't, I mean, well, I guess if one opened up, I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a fan. Of Not it. even sure I'd walk through it really. <laughs> no, but there's no ghosts in this one. There's no one that loses their head, but, uh, 
but the um, being tortured and then your wounds miraculously healed is a, a pretty amazing twist in the story. Um, these like uh, these early Christian saints. Um, I mean, you can kind of tell the, the sort of like the world that these people are shaped in, though, like where <laughs> uh, torture is imminent always. Yeah. And you kind of just have to like um, hope that hope that uh, whatever you're doing is uh, good enough to become a saint yeah. or whatever. <laughs> Yikes. Um, but a really interesting story nonetheless. Man, it'd be a great movie. Um, I want, I want, I want this uh, portal on film. Uh, also, I do love the um, even like. Also, in this story, there's just sort of like morality play upon morality play. It's like yeah. okay, so she's like hiding her faith and kind of like exp- and uh, secretly expressing it through this like window. Okay, and then like she kind of reveals it, but then there's also this like um, this like Good Samaritan story where like one of these shepherds <laughs> is going to help her and that's cool. The other one doesn't, and then he gets turned to stone. It's like man, you really messed up. Um, just a lot, a lot going on. Um, if, uh, <laughs> there, there's no subtlety at all in, in these stories and I love it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, all right. One last saint that we could talk about here. This is, um, I don't know, maybe an honorable mention, uh, not super spooky, but definitely within the, the, the realm here of what we've been talking about. Uh, St. Sebastian, a uh, very fun, cool saint. We should talk about him. We should do a whole episode on St. Sebastian at some point. Um, he, according to Wikipedia, again, had prudently concealed his faith, but in 286 it was detected. Diocletian reproached him for his supposed betrayal, and he commanded him to be led to a field and there to be bound to a stake so that certain archers from uh, somewhere else would shoot arrows at him. And the archers shot at him until he was as full of arrows as an urchin, uh, full of pricks, and thus left him there for dead. Miraculously, the arrows did not kill him. The widow of Castellus, Irene of Rome, went to retrieve his body and buried it and discovered he was still alive. She brought him back to her house, nursed him back to health. That's probably a long nursing, I would guess. Uh, Sebastian later stood by a staircase where the emperor was to pass uh, and, and harangued Diocletian for his cruelties against Christians. This freedom of speech and from a person whom he supposed to have been dead greatly astonished the emperor. So there's a good ghost story. But recovering from his yeah. surprise, he gave orders for Sebastian to be seized and beaten to death with cudgels and his body thrown into the common sewer. Uh, let's see here. A pious lady named Lucina, admonished by the martyr in a vision, privately removed the body and buried it in the catacombs at the entrance, uh, entrance of a cemetery of Calixtus, where he now where now stands the Basilica of St. Sebastian. Um, lots of great stuff about St. Sebastian. Uh, he is another person whose iconography you should look up. Uh, Google it for sure. It's very famous. Um, he has turned into a gay icon, which is really fascinating. Um, that's why I said we should do a whole episode on him sometime and kind of the cultural reception maybe of uh, his iconography. But um, I do love uh, <laughs> filling him with arrows and then being very surprised to see him alive again when he's just harassing you in the street. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, extremely um interesting iconography. Um definitely look this one up. This one, the though the iconography around um Saint Sebastian is not like it's not spooky, though he is filled with arrows. <laughs> and you'll <laughs> maybe you'll make you'll make all the connections with the uh the sort of being being like an LGBTQ icon for sure if you look at the if you look at the pictures. Um some subtlety for sure, <laughs> but uh but you'll get the picture, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. On the spooky scale, this one's spooky, man. Where would you, you place him someone... relative to our other three spooky saints? Uh, I think this is more um, straightforwardly spooky, like real spooky, than um, Saint Dennis. All right. And pr- and probably, uh, you know, not, but not as, sp- well, I don't know, man, pretty spooky. It's not, it's not getting your skin flayed, but you are like dead a lot True. by arrows which isn't great you know sort of different a different type of bodily horror um so i think he's up there i think he's up there amongst the truth the truly spooky <laughs> <laughs> so let's see in ascending order then we have saint barbara at the bottom she's she's spooky for kids uh, if you have to tell your kids sure. a halloween saint it's gonna be saint barbara then we've got the action adventure story of saint barbara where she doesn't die and just does kind of like time jump through yeah. portals or something 
I mean, there's this, there's such a, uh, this is like one step away from being like Doctor Who or something. Yeah. And it's great. <laughs> exactly. Um, then we've got St. Dennis walking around with his head, uh, having a very bad headache, uh, needing an aspirin that is going to be, I don't know, two pumpkins out of five. Um, not as spooky as it could be, but definitely pretty <laughs> spooky. Uh, then we have um, St. Sebastian. Let's, let's give him a four pumpkins and a little gourd. Uh, and yeah, okay. and then we have Bartholomew, who is a five pumpkin lit jack o' lantern level of spooky saint. I think that's right. I think that sounds good to me. Very agreeable. Um, it just like strikes me, kind of reading through these things. First of all, I feel like as a Protestant, sort of robbed of this history in a lot of ways, which is a bummer. Um, not that these are historical accounts necessarily. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but this is a part of like uh, the Catholic tradition that is really neat. I think the more that you consider it and the more you think about the ways that these stories, I don't know, are either just fun or kind of tell you something illustrative or about like Christian life. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, just such a bummer not having them. Um, That reminds me. Okay, so you became Episcopal and I'm pretty sure you told me, but what saint did you pick for your confirmation name? I didn't. You didn't. Well, there's still (laughs) time. Oh, I could. Yeah, I could, you know, but the Episcopal Church, they have a whole nother, they, they get way more wet and wild with their saints, though, you know, they've got a lot of just like regular people on there. Right, right. But you get all the old ones up until, I don't know, some year or whatever. You got these spooky guys. That's true. That's true. I could pick, I could pick a one of these spooky guys. That would be, okay. St. Bartholomew, though, that would be great, because then I would just pray to him every time I do need something. Like, if I'm going grocery shopping, <laughs> right, and right. I do need these bags to be a little bit lighter so I can get them all in one trip. Right. That would be ideal. Or when you're trying to fool the old prospector with your fool's gold and you need it to be a little heavier, you can always give him a prayer, yeah. too. <laughs> That's right. You know, um, also, I mean, we don't need to, like, uh, <laughs> we don't need to become overly philosophical about these things, though I guess I'm about to do that. <laughs> um, just thinking about, um, so, okay. Uh, recently, Dean, you haven't seen it. You're not a fan of spooky things, and that's okay. You don't need to be. But I did watch the the show Midnight Mass, mm-hmm. um, which is produced by the same person who made uh, my one of my favorite TV shows of all time, called The Haunting of Hill House. And um, both of these shows are very interesting in the ways that they are incredibly graphic. I mean, and pretty pretty grotesque when it comes to the depiction um, of dead people um and man that kind of thing always really fascinates me um ever since i started started getting into like people like julia kristeva and um she has a a big essay called the abject um it's an essay that she wrote about horror which there's a lot going on in it but it does always make me think twice about um you know whenever you hear a story about death or whatever uh, exactly, you know, what's being communicated or or what death means within the structure of those narratives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like in a show like The Haunting of Hill House or in Midnight Mass, you know, death doesn't always mean, you know, death. It means something else. Like um, in Midnight Mass, uh, there is sort of a ghostly apparition of a woman that one of the characters have, has killed. That's not a spoiler. That just happens in the very first <laughs> minute of the show. So it's not just it's fine. I promise. Um, but it's interesting, though, because, like, you know, even, like, a grotesque death that is trying to be, in some ways, like, abjectly horrible or something still has the significance behind it of, like, something that it means. And uh, these stories have something similar in them, too, that I think is really fascinating, where it's, like, you know, they paint, paint these, like, really grotesque pictures of these, like, you know, the death or torture of these saints, which is probably real because that that happened. <laughs> But uh, they always mean something more than their deaths. And it's never just about like the spookiness of it. And uh, I don't know. I just, just really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Death is such a hard thing to really grapple with um, cognitively. Like, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> it's a big existential question. So uh, but it's always really fascinating when people use it to communicate something different or you know, something very profound about living or something. Yeah, I think that's right. Well, there's something interesting, too, just about Christianity's relationship to death. I think, obviously, lots of people avoid death uh, via Christianity or kind of don't face up to it in an authentic way. And that is true. And I'm sure we've all seen it a hundred times. But I think that there's also something fascinating about how the belief that death is defeated also enables Christianity to get kind of weird with it. So. When yeah. you think about something like Bartholomew, 
uh, or St. Dennis, right, where um, the way that they're depicted is kind of uh, an affront to death as well. It's like like Bartholomew is sort of flaunting the fact that he's flayed alive, right? Or uh, Dennis walking around with his head. Um, it's this kind of, uh, I guess, like poking fun at the idea of death in this really serious way. And I like that as well. Like, there's something about that that's really attractive, that if you really do kind of lean into Christianity's dream of, uh, you know, not just liberation in this world, but even liberation after it, uh, there's something about being liberated from death itself that uh, requires you to, like, depict it in all of its horror, you know, <laughs> to, like, not shy away from it, but be like, yeah, this guy just skin ripped off. I don't know. <laughs> what do you want? He's a saint now. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? He's a saint now. That's true. Um I don't know. <laughs> what else? <laughs> what else? Um, here's something I could say. I the saint that I picked uh, for my confirmation as a young Catholic boy in Catholic school was um, St. Martin is the name that I chose. But here's the wild thing. If you look up St. Martin, most of the time people will find Martin of Tours, who is usually remembered as like the first pacifist. He was a soldier who uh, converted and um I don't know, got out of the military, basically. Uh, and I wish that it were the case that I chose such a radical saint or that was like the story that moved me as, I don't know, like a, I don't forget how old it was, 10 or something, probably like sixth grade or whatever. Um, but in fact, you know, what's the name for that phenomenon where like you totally remember something that happened in the past, but like you can't find any empirical proof for it. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's like... Uh just remembering something incorrectly. No, no, like uh, that phenomenon where like you remember in a movie, someone said something or like a song that went this way. There's a name for this phenomenon. And, uh, you know, you're so convinced that you have this memory, but like, no, there's no way to prove one way or the other that it did or didn't happen. Anyway, okay. someone is listening to this podcast and they know what it is. That's all that matters. Do you mean like the Mandela? Thing? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Oh, okay. um, Whoa. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Great poll. So I have that, but with with saints going on right now, because in my brain, I am so convinced that there's this story of a St. Martin who was a soldier, but I promise it wasn't Martin of Tours, was a soldier and uh, had his leg blown off by a cannonball. And then on his like deathbed, the devil appeared to him to like tempt him and he like told the devil off. And I remember being like a young Catholic boy and getting so psyched about that, being like, first of all, this guy is like blown off by a cannonball, that rules. And then secondly, like he told the devil off to his face, and that also rules. So that's why I chose the name St. Martin. And I've told this story to a lot of other Catholics trying to find a source <laughs> for where it could come from. And Hector, a Sarah Ferrer, who we had on this podcast a long time ago to talk about Columbia, he also remembers this story from somewhere, but neither of us could find a Googling. So if you, dear listener, know what I'm talking about or have a memory, please do reach out. Tell us what the heck I'm talking about. But anyway, a spooky saint. <laughs> this is like people from people from Universe B. They all know <laughs> yeah. exactly what you're talking about. But people from Universe A have no idea. Exactly. Because that's like not the right Martin. Of exactly. Course. Exactly. So um, that's a, a good spooky saint, though. The devil appeared to him on on his deathbed and he was like, get out of here. Get out of town. Yeah. I mean, if that saint doesn't exist, they should. Right. Yeah. Like that seems like a good one. Yeah. It's a great story. <laughs> we have to. <laughs> We have to make that saint up if he doesn't. Exist. Yeah, just put him on, on Wikipedia and there you have it. I think that's basically how canonization works nowadays. <laughs> that's it's all really straightforward and streamlined. You do have to have a Wikipedia page and that's it. That's all the steps. <laughs> you you definitely can't open a case for canonization without a Wikipedia page today, I think. <laughs> it's true. You you just can't. You need a Wikipedia page first. Um miraculous apparitions, uh other kinds of miracles, those are all second, but the Wikipedia page is number one. That's the other thing, though. We devils, devils are spooky. Maybe we should talk about that next time um, as we keep oh, on yeah. this uh, October theme. Devils, demons, exorcism. You know, we we did uh, two or three years ago. Matt and I couldn't think of any episode for a podcast every week, and we were so desperate. And so we decided to do these like themes where we would just talk about stuff for a month. So we did one for Halloween. We did one for Christmas. And I thought for sure that like, 
oh no, we'll never have anything else to talk about with respect to these things ever again. But uh, here we are talking about <laughs> spooky saints. And uh, now we're going to, I think, have to talk about demons or devils or exorcisms later on. We'll find a good left wing take about that. I'm sure they're out there. Yeah. Well, there's so many. I mean, the exorcism one is pretty. It, that one, that episode writes itself for yeah. sure. Um, yeah, that sounds good. We should do that. Um, you know, people... Uh, People are so traumatized by that part of their, <laughs> I mean, speaking of deconstruction last week, yeah. that's a big, a big thing that I think uh, I, I have so many friends that are still struggling with that. Like, not that they like really believe in demons and devils or whatever, or like that they're out to get them. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, evil exists in the world in all kinds of different ways. And uh, maybe demons aren't one of them, but who knows? Uh, but anyway, it's just like that weird evangelical upbringing has really scarred them mm-hmm. <laughs> because of all of the, uh, the hell houses and whatnot. Um yeah <laughs> yeah spooky for some people yeah not for me i don't care not a, not a problem for me i'm good did you ever have uh i don't know i don't know why the podcast is turning here now but did you ever have when you were a teen or or a kid or whatever like a, a genuine legitimate fear that like demons were around you or in your bedroom or anything like that no i don't think so you know one time okay this is a real this is a real scary story a real christian scary story <laughs> one time i was spending the night at my friend's house and he told me this story um where uh this okay <laughs> let me see if i can recall it from being like <laughs> 10 uh there's a story about these uh, a murderer who broke into somebody's mm-hmm. house because like that's what they that's what murderers mm-hmm. do is they're always prowling your neighborhood and they're always trying to find the best house to break into <laughs> the best house to do a murder <laughs> yeah exactly that's what they're looking for 24 7 anyway so this uh this murderer breaks into a house and he kills the entire family inside of it but um, <laughs> this is, I swear to God, this is how this, this is how this person told the story to me. They, this, this family, uh, they had a parrot and the parrot said, Jesus is going to get you. Mm-hmm. And then lo and behold, um, like a giant, like pit bull appeared out of the darkness of this house and like got the murder. Mm-hmm. And that was the spooky story. So it's spooky for late. a lot of reasons. Cause yeah, a little too late is the thing. It's spooky for a lot of reasons, mostly because your your entire family dies in it, and that's really spooky. But then also, uh, God comes and gets revenge in the form of a big a big dog, and that is okay, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, so many plot holes though. I think that's the worst part of it. Uh, why didn't the parrot invoke the name of Jesus Christ earlier? Why didn't the family of true Christians invoke the name of Jesus Christ uh, to ward off this this demon murderer? Um, I'm, a lot of plot holes, but it does go to show you that you do need to tell your birds and your pets about Jesus <laughs> today. Don't wait. Right, don't wait. Exactly. Yeah. Because uh, who knows who's prowling around in your neighborhood right now? Um, let's see. We got a lot of spooky stuff in this episode. That last story. That's a that's a five out of five pumpkins. I think. Oh yeah. For, for me, still. If you're if you're um, ten, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. If you're an adult. Uh, less so, but whatever. if you're an adult like yeah, me so... who doesn't like anything spooky, it's more of a four <laughs> a four pumpkin on the five pumpkin race. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, I'm I'm sorry for telling you that so close to your bedtime. <laughs> but I had I had to do it for the podcast. Yeah, I understand. Um, let's see. All right, what else can we say about these saints before we sign it off? Uh, saints. I, I don't know what to say about them. <laughs> they're they're spooky. They're scary. Oh, here's here's a good one. If a saint, if you pray to a saint. And like, let's say you prayed to St. Bartholomew for someone to get heavier specifically. Um, Like, uh, like, Uh okay, you play softball. Here's a great example, Matt. You're in the big softball game against that other church Uh on the other side of St. Louis. And you are praying. It's the last uh, inning. Um, You're praying that that baseball bat just gets heavier and heavier. And it did actually happen. Would you be spooked or would you be excited? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Am I hoping that the baseball gets the baseball bat gets heavier so I can use it to hit a big home run or so the other person misses? Uh, I was thinking so the other person misses. You don't want to throw off your own weight. OK, well, yeah, OK, that's fine. Uh, if it happened, I would be excited. That's a good miracle, I think. Um, you know, it's not the flayed, the not the flayed man showing up to like get your bones or whatever this is just like you win the you win the big softball game i think that's cool now what if in exchange though for getting that big miracle Mm -hmm. you did have to see the big flayed man showing up with all his his skin and bones ah would that be a fair trade 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's exactly 100% fair trade. I win the softball game and I do have to see the spooky guy, but that's okay. You're welcome. I'm going to get ice cream after the game's over and it's not going to be a big deal. <laughs> see, I think there are some things where like if it worked, if I prayed and, and it worked, the miracle worked, it wouldn't be spooky, right? Like you ask St. Anthony to help you find your keys. That's fine. Um, would not be scared of that. But like, I think there is sort of a scale of coincidence where at a certain point I'd probably be too freaked out. I'd be like, this isn't, yeah. I don't want this. <laughs> It'd be better not to have the miracle in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, you can keep that. It's just too, it would be too big. And and the baseball bat one is getting closer and closer to it. Yeah. You know, there was, uh, when, as I was doing research, <laughs> okay, <laughs> with with heavy air quotes around it, <laughs> while I was doing research for this episode, uh, I did find, this is bleeding into our podcast, our, our Patreon podcast territory, but I did find a post on the, uh, the Catholicism subreddit. Mm-hmm. And uh, the question was um, something like, um, I'm 17 years old. I have a long, healthy life ahead of me. If I pray every day for my entire life that God will give me a vision of a saint, do you think that will happen? Mm. And in the comments, everyone was like, well, some people are like, no, that won't happen. And then some people are like, well, you never know. And I think the real question is, do you want that? to happen? <laughs> yeah. Probably not. These you don't want these scary these scary guys and gals to come into your house and say something to you, even if it is extremely wise. Um, they're too spooky. You know what's so funny about that? My my wife Emily, um, she was telling me not too long ago that she uh she when she was a kid, she would like pray in her bed that Jesus wouldn't come and appear before her because it would be too scary. She's like, that would be too Absolutely. unexpected. And I love that so much being like, look, I love you and all, but like, can you just stay out of my room? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it would be, she's not wrong. It'd be spooky, man. It would be. They're always spooked in the Bible. Whenever something godly or ungodly appears, I think, you know, humans are just, uh, we're easy to spook, especially when it comes to all that, uh, again, metaphysical, non-materialist stuff going on out here, man. We are talking around the whole plot of Midnight Mass so much right now. I want you to watch the spooky show, Dean. You're going to love it. Uh, all right. Maybe I'll watch it in the middle of the day at 3 p.m. on a Sunday after church. And uh, crack, we'll see. Crack those windows open. Get the light streaming in. And just sit back and enjoy the 10 episodes of the scariest thing you're ever going to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. I'll queue up an episode of it's Drag not, Race afterwards and I can scary. feel better about it. Yeah, of course. That's a good way of going about it. You have to have the good palate cleanser. You know, that's what that's what we do. We're watching a Squid Game right now, and it's a lot. So uh, the rule is we can only watch Squid Game if we can also watch an episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> you got to balance yourself out like that. That's so important. All right. We've done it again. Um, it's another spooky one, and I guess we might do another spooky one next week. So if you didn't like this one, <laughs> maybe take a break, take a week off, because uh, we're yeah. not going to. If you think this is somehow uncharacteristic of our podcast, you would have missed the entire month we did talk about Christmas. So <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Although I'll say in our defense of the Christmas month, we did we lined up a number of actual scholars to talk to us yeah. about what Christmas is about. So we did a we did a pretty good job. Yeah, this is a podcast about Christianity, leftist politics, and also our favorite holidays which are mostly halloween (laughs) the nightmare before christmas it's going to be the the sort of um the i don't know what the name is now i'm I'm struggling for so many terms but whatever that astrological moment where uh you know the the eclipse i guess when the sun and moon finally align that's right (laughs) that's what it is all right folks We did it. Uh, thanks for listening to Magnificast. If you like what you heard in this one, then that's great for you. Hopefully you're not too spooked. I mean, I'm sure you're not. It wasn't that scary. It's a This episode, I think, is probably a two pumpkins out of five. Even though we talked about content that is a five pumpkin out of five, mm-hmm. we're pretty... I mean, just talking about it's okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways, if you do like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Our intro music is by Amari Armstrong, and our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon, and we'll see you next time. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.
Jackson. You keep your hoods up. You keep your hoods up. And you stay up late. In Jackson. You keep your hoods up. Well, you keep your hoods up. And you stay up late. Oh, don't mind. A cold night. But we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early, at least I would have.